things in real life are probably very few. So it is with a sense of ritual and improvisation conjoined while in potential conflict, rather than suggesting that either ever exists independently of the other, that we may approach a phenomenon in art, specifically in the art of Armenian magical manuscripts, particularly the scrolls called Hamayil, that are employed for defense against demons, particularly against the ancient child-stealing witch, called in Armenian Al, see here, or in the next picture. Tabcha. These are illustrations from a history of ancient Armenian religion by Hevon Alishan of the Mechitaris Monastery. I invent. These scrolls contain a number of prayers pulled from scripture, Christian hagiography, and the writings of Armenian theologians and mystics, as well as incantations that are fairly standard from one scroll to another. And these texts generally follow a prescribed order. They're divided by pictures of Christ, the saints, and demons. Again, usually in a similar order. All this is ritualistic. Though the content and iconography of the scrolls are freer in general than the program of a gospel manuscript. And the performance of magic never has the same social sanction as the liturgy of the church. Indeed, more often than not, the church condemns all forms of it. Still, the artist scribe who made these scrolls worked in compliance with a fixed tradition that had been handed down to him. Indeed, the texts and traditions having to do with the child stealing witch, the Al, the Tubcha, and their company, and their origins, and to date by many centuries, the canonical text of the Bible itself. However, the maker of a magical scroll usually lacked very much serious training as an artist. And though his work reflects the themes and styles of the iconography of the church in which he grew up, it almost always looks primitive, even childlike, in its relative lack of technical sophistication. And beside the abundant gold leaf, the paint made of lapis lazuli, the embossed silver of fine liturgical gospel manuscripts, the homayos seem an art of poverty. The art of the scrolls can also be bold and uncanny, though in a way that gospel book illumination is not and is never intended to be, including fanciful symbols and strange patterns, variations on canonical pictures. And when these depart very widely from recognized forms, one can discern the mark of individuality and of improvisation. The principal purpose of the Hamayus has always been to protect women in childbirth. They thus have their closest analogs in the Christian magical manuscripts of other contiguous or orthodox Christian cultures, Byzantium most directly, but most strikingly of all, and I'll return to this in detail, Ethiopia. However, there are others. The Jewish child bent talismanic texts against the demoness Lilith, who was also a child-stealing witch, and the ancient Mesopotamian ones against the demon called Lamashtum prove that the Armenian and other Christian works belong to a wider and older Near Eastern tradition. In Armenian Christian literature, from its beginnings down to recent times and without interruption, theologians and clerics have devoted detailed and impassioned sermons and treatises to the condemnation of the kind of magic that the scrolls represent. This is, in its way, testimony to their early presence and their long continuity in the culture. Thus, however far removed a maker of scrolls might have been from a, from a monastic scriptorium, and however idiosyncratic his gift might be, he still inherited a settled tradition of great antiquity in which he was expected to operate with relative freedom, both by his instructors in the magical art and by the clients for whom he produced his talismans. Unfortunately, we know very little about the Armenian artists who made these scrolls. 
what inspired them to take up such work, how they were trained, how they were regarded by others in their communities, what their working days and their inner lives might have been like. It would seem, though, that most of them possessed the title Diratsu, that is, a man not ordained as a priest, but permitted to perform some sacerdotal functions. The position of the Diratsu in Armenia is analogous to that of the present-day Ethiopian Deptera, also a non-ordained priest allowed to perform certain functions who makes scrolls. And the detailed recent studies of the, the Ethiopian scroll makers by ethnographers and philologists interested in the East Christian culture of that East African country may help one to construct a hypothetical picture of some of the aspects of the life of the Diratsu magician. And the Deptera, the Ethiopian scroll maker, in his turn, has attracted the attention of art historians interested in the genre defined in English as outsider art, or in French as art. Though such art has existed as long as any other kinds of art have done, the definition of it as a distinct genre and the methods of its study are relatively new and mark a break with conventional and canon-oriented approaches both to artists themselves in society and to their work. Though the genre covers a wide range of kinds and media of artistic production, one may attempt a general definition or better a characterization of outsider art, since it is used frequently to describe the Ethiopian art so similar to the Armenian. The outsider artist, man or woman, for there are both, typically has not received formal training in painting or sculpture. And even if he or she has studied formal techniques, they have made a decision to break with them in some radical manner in the course of their work. So the first thing the outsider artist is outside of is the scriptorium, or in modern times, the salon, the academy, the 57th Street Gallery. And sometimes that is as far as it goes. And we have the innocuous art called folk art of Grandma Moses and hundreds of others. But the genre was not defined simply to encompass naivete. It addresses far more troubling subjects and deeper sorts of social and artistic alienation. An outsider artist can also be a person who is the result of a powerful initiatory dream, or a waking hallucination, as our psychologized society now calls prophetic vision, or trauma, as it now calls the experience of the tragic aspect of life, is impelled to paint or sculpt, and to do so in prodigious quantities and at the cost of extreme effort. Typically, an outsider artist produces hundreds, even thousands of 